Welcome to another episode of Life and Whiskey. As always, I'm Jordan, and today we're going to explore George Dickel Rye. Okay, so I had talked before about getting into a couple of different varieties other than bourbon, rye being one of them. Um, the last video I did was Minor Case, uh, a really interesting rye, kind of on a bright, florally end of the spectrum. Uh, George Dickel Rye is a little bit more on the herbal, black licorice, classic spicy rye side of things so there's a little bit of a spectrum there um oddly enough or interestingly enough i guess i should say uh, this is also an mgp product um and it's also a nas so a non-age statement whiskey so it's at least four years old and is also 90 proof or 45 percent abv that's a really common proof to find a rye at is 90 um, so, you know, that, that is, um, you know, it's just a common proof to find. I, I guess I don't really know where to go with that statement, but you'll find most of them are going to be sitting right around there. Uh, every now and again, you get some higher proof ones, which is interesting. Um, this is, let's see, George Dickel is owned by, I don't know if it's Diageo or Diego, um, but that's the parent company. And uh, I was able to buy this bottle for $18.69. So it's um, kind of a lower pro lower priced rye. Um, and for that price, it's an extremely good rye. I highly recommend it. Um, but let's get into it. Let's see where this goes. Um, and then we got some talking points after that. So get in here. It's very classic rye. Uh, you get black licorice up front. That's kind of dominating, mixed with some herbal notes. Um, it's definitely got some minty characteristics to it. Um, but then following that up, after you get through those first kind of dominating notes, it kind of mellows out and turns into this floral, buffalo, classic buffalo trace smell, that floral, uh, apple, light flower. Uh, you can maybe pick out a little bit of eucalyptus, which is something that you're going to find in a, a fair number of rye whiskeys um and again that when i say buffalo trace even though it's not a buffalo trace product it just has that signature floral component that i find in almost all of their products if you look at the sazerac rye that buffalo trace puts out that too has that very classic non-mistakable buffalo trace smell to it so um that's definitely definitely one that i get if you go back to it you almost get like a you know, uh, so I, I lived in Montana for a while and out in Washington for a while, and it was, you know, in 2014, 15, 16, when that, the, the microbrewery IPA craze was maybe at its height or, you know, gearing up for its height, for its peak. And everywhere you went, every brewery you went to, the goal was to see who could get the most battery acid IPA that you could possibly get. You know, what what brewery could get the most bittering units or IBUs into an IPA. This stuff was, in my opinion, absolutely rancid, not pleasurable to drink, super, super bitter. You know, some people really like that. I'm not a glutton for punishment. But um, where I'm going with that thought is this has that IPA bitter hop nose to it. Like, if you wanted to sum it up, if you had a crisp, IPA that was not overly citrusy, but leaning more towards this floral component, that's kind of what you're getting out of this. Luckily for us, it doesn't have a ton of that on, on the taste. Um, it starts out that way. So, it starts out with just a hint of that bitter hop note so some might say that that's that herbal um black licorice mint combination but it's underlain with a syrupy sweetness um that quickly moves into a floral component and um and kind of gets away with that bitter like it never really shows up like you know how you can smell the ipa bitter hopness and it's very uh, it's a very distinct smell that does not come through on the taste so much if it is it's like just a brief second right at the very forward position 
but it's not a dominating note at all, and it moves past that very, very quickly. Um, but then it kind of moves into this floral sweetness that's underlaying um, some of the other stuff that's going on. So it's like this herbalness. Again, I always talk about chartreuse. So if you've ever had chartreuse as a liquor, it's very herbal but sweet at the same time. Um, it kind of has notes like that where it's like this herbal spiciness and then it's underlaying with this syrupy sweetness. Um, I really, really like that. Uh, the flavor profile on this is very, very short. So it's like maybe four notes, four different flavors up front. Boom, 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 boom. And it goes right through those and then it moves into this, this, uh, it, it just dissipates really quick after that. There, there's really no lasting finish on it or anything like that. It just moves through it really quick. Um, but it ends kind of sugary sweet. So let's go ahead and find the finish on this. Nose is still kind of the same. So I get, I mean, the finish on it's kind of herbal sweet as well. So it kind of carries through the, that floral herbal sweetness. And so I said it kind of started with a black licorice. It also ends with a, lack, a black licorice that is more pronounced, and that's kind of the ending flavor profile, I would say. It's like this sweet black licorice going forward. Um, so I said that, it, you know, I find myself saying some of the sim same tasty notes that I found in the minor case. I would say that at minor case, they have the same notes, but the way that they're presenting are different. So minor case brought that forward, floral, sweet, pleasant um, note. That's kind of where that dominated. This one's more dominating in the spiciness category. Black licorice. It's underlaying with some sweet. And none of it's spiky. It's very well-rounded, and the flavors come together and, and transition very nicely from one to the next. But it's over here. So this is more herbal, spicy, black peppery, um, and then the minor case is more sweet, floral, apple, um, those types of notes. So they are on different ends of the spectrum, but they have a lot, they share some common interests and it's definitely rye. There's no mistaking that it's rye. Um, it's really good. I highly suggest going out, giving it a try. Um, for $18.69, there's really no, you know, there's no reason not to give this a whirl. And it's very, it's just a pleasant, pleasant whiskey to have. Okay, so with that, so as I've mentioned in some of my other videos, I hope people are getting out, getting after things. Um, COVID's kind of starting to wane a little bit, and uh, laws and restrictions and rules and I don't know. I don't know what to call them other than decrees are starting to be lessened. Um, and uh, with that, here in the West, uh, a phenomenon called runoff is starting. Um, it has been going pretty strong. Last week, we had two or three days in the upper 70s, mid and upper 80s even. Um, and what runoff is, is this, the winter snowpack up in the mountains is melting and you know when it's hot out it melts really quick and what that means for people like myself who love to go out and fly fish and stuff is it's more and more difficult to find a stream that isn't what they call blown out um you know you look at it it looks like chocolate milk right so as the, the snow melts and creates water the water starts moving downhill with gravity picking up sediment as it's running off the landscape and then that gets in um into the water system, which then increases uh, something called turbidity, which is how clear the water is. It increases the turbidity, and visibility in the water decreases greatly, and um, it makes fishing not as good as it could be. And I, you can still get out and fishing, you can still be successful, but it's not anywhere near as good. Um, success rates are quite low, and um, the tactics you got to use are a fair bit different. And so. Uh, a lot of people just stay home for a month, month and a half, depending on snowpack and whatever else. You can get out if there's dams in the system, in the river system that you're planning on fishing. 
the dams will control and reduce that sediment load and the turbidity. So if you fish below a dam, um, you know, depending on the size of the stream and stuff, and where the next creek is that comes into that river system that's providing sediment, you might have a good couple of miles of fishing, you know, maybe even 10 or 15 miles, depending on, on the river system and stuff. And so um, a lot of people fish, fish those dam systems. Um, if you have a, an undammed river, uh, like here in Wyoming, the Tongue River's undammed, um, the Yellowstone over in Montana, uh, there's no dams on that for quite a ways. In fact, that might, actually, I don't think there's a single dam on the Yellowstone River. From its headwaters all the way to the confluence with the Missouri over in North Dakota, there's not a dam at all on the Yellowstone River. Um, and so, those rivers get really, really blown out, and, you know, you just have to wait for that snow pack to melt and that water to uh, clarify a little bit before the fishing really starts to pick up. And uh, that's often a big bummer for people who enjoy fly fishing. That either means A, you fish a dam, B, you fish on in a different state, maybe further south or somewhere where there wasn't as much snow or, um, you know, you have to find a stream that's, that's fairly fishable. Um, or the alternative is gear up and scout for when the water clarifies the runoff ends. Um, so depending on, you know, when you can get vacation time from work, uh, you know, what your schedule looks like, what your other hobbies look like, stuff like that. I would recommend getting out and giving uh, fly tying a try if you haven't. Uh, you can really save some money. I make um, streamers. I, if you look at some of my other videos, I, I showed a streamer pattern that I like to tie. I'm very successful with that. Um, in fact, first week of April, I was over on the Bighorn, caught a nice 24-inch, somewhere three to five pound, uh, brown trout with that missed a couple other really nice rainbows um, You know th th Go ahead and give that a try when you're talking that a fly if you're throwing streamers you you might be running Three four five six dollars a streamer and you get that sucker hung up on a rock or whatever You're gonna lose flies. I can tie them for about I think it's less than a buck I can tie them for less than a buck a piece. So it's definitely you know, they're not pretty they're not um, professional grade or whatever, but they get the job done, and that's really all I'm looking for. So, um, I highly suggest that you go out and give that a try. Now's the time to start stocking up. Um, you know, even even the little flies, you know, the dry flies and whatever else, they can run a dollar, two dollars, three dollars a piece, um, and you know, it might cost you twenty five to fifty cents to tie one. So, go out and give that a try. Start stocking up. You know, tie as many as you can so that you can just fish all summer long without having to worry about restocking. Um, you know, same thing is true for people who don't fly fish. You know, if you're, uh, if you're a walleye fisherman, start tying your, um, your, your Lindy rigs and stuff like that, you know, with your beads and your spinners and your, your worm harnesses and stuff like that. Just tie a couple hundred of those. Have them ready. So all you gotta do is clip them onto that swivel and away you go. Um, you know, if you fly fish in, uh, in, on non trout streams in the, in the east and you're on a, a regular river or, uh, warm water and you're throwing for pike or bass or whatever, tie some of those flies. Uh, my old man, he used to tie and make his own spinnerbaits when I was a kid and crankbaits. I still have a couple of them. They worked great. Um, you know, he poured his own spinnerbait weighted jig heads and everything and, you know, tied out or put on the, the blades and the beads and tied on his own skirts and um, he did it all kinds of interesting stuff. Another hobby to get into, he used to buy crankbait blanks and then paint them and, and create his own patterns doing that. Um, there's a ton of stuff you can do while you're waiting for water conditions to be favorable so that you can have a better fishing experience, um, whatever species you're targeting. Um, so go ahead and give that a try. Um, I mentioned scouting, you know, do like here doing some e-scouting helps, like finding fishing access points, um, learning what the rules are, where you're at. So like here in Wyoming, we have really crappy rules when it comes to access. So in Wyoming, the landowner owns out to the middle of the river. So if one side of the river is public, say BLM land, and the other side is private land, you can only go out to the middle of the river. Now, all the water, you can float, right?
but you, if you're on the private side of the river, you can't wade, you can't drop your anchor, you're, nothing is allowed to touch the bottom of the river in that location. So as long as you're floating, you're fine, but as far as access goes, that cuts off a ton of access to stuff. States like Montana, it's completely different. All you have to do is legally access that water, which means any bridge that crosses a river or a body of water, you can put in at that bridge because the river or the road has a right of way going across that. And if you're inside that right of way, once you're in the river, you can walk in the water or up to the high water mark, I believe, as far as you want. So you can go miles and miles and miles. So if you want to go fish right in front of that, you know, five million dollar uh, McMansion on the Madison River, you can go stand right in front of that house and fish as long as you're in, inside the high water mark because it's public access in the river and you can wade anywhere you want that way, um, which is really nice. Hopefully someday Wyoming wisens up and gets rid of that kind of BS, but I don't know. We're pretty stubborn here. Our legislature has rules and family names that go back generations here, so I highly doubt it's going to happen. But there's a lot of different organizations that are working on trying to change that. So, with all that being said, now's the time to start looking at how to access waterways, no matter what state you're going to. Um, you know, you can get an idea if you do Google Earth, you can look and see where different riffles are, or rapids, or obstacles that if you're going to float a river, you're going to have to go around. Or if you're wading, you can find different pools, different areas. Um, to look at. Uh, you can really get a sense of a river by looking at it before you actually get there. You can check out, um, again using Google Earth, what the elevation is, where you're you know, upstream and downstream and see what kind of grade the river has. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with aerial imagery, Google Earth, that type of stuff to really do some scouting and find some unique fishing areas. You know, you can find out whether or not it's worth packing into a river or a lake or something that's up in the mountains, maybe three, four miles back, that doesn't see a lot of people. Um, those types of things are great opportunities to find while you have nothing else to do and you're waiting for the snow to melt. Um, and then I also mentioned warm water fishing. Uh, and, and right now in the spring, as waters warm up, with the warm water fisheries, uh, you know, spawn's going to be starting for them. So most of the trout spawning has already occurred. But, um, you know, if you look at largemouth and panfish and um, some of those warm water species, they're, they're not going to start spawning until, you know, the end of May, which it is the end of May, you know, Memorial Day weekend. But, um, you know, right about now till uh, maybe into June a little bit, uh, you find those places where the water temperatures are right and you can hit the spawn really well on some of those fish species. So get out there, give all that stuff a try. Maybe pick up a bottle of George Dickel rye and see if it you know, suits your palate. I highly recommend it. As always, if you like this video, please like, subscribe, share this video, comment below. Any comments are welcome, good, bad, or otherwise. Um, as I said, $18.69 for this bottle. Let me know what you can find it for in your area. I'd love to hear. Um, you know what kind of price ranges are out there and we'll, we'll keep this uh, little encyclopedia of price going um i've been looking at the comments not too many people have made any comments in fact you know my viewership is pretty low if you are viewing please make sure you're engaging with the video to help boost my numbers a little bit um but i really would like to see those numbers in there because those numbers will help up everybody and maybe you're you know close enough to a place where you can find bottles cheaper somewhere else and uh, you're not paying those premium prices so anyways thanks for watching i'll catch you guys on the next video i appreciate everything you're doing please keep it up have yourselves a great day